Well, Pakistan's foreign minister, Hina Rabbani Kar, is just one of the many world leaders attending the 16th NAM summit in the Iranian capital, Tehran. In an interview with Press TV's correspondent, she lashed out at the U.S. for its drone strikes in Pakistan. You see, Pakistan's position on that is clear today, and it has been clear in the past. Our position is that this is something which is uh, counterproductive, it is unlawful, it is illegal, and therefore they must cease. And this is what the Parliament of Pakistan has clearly said. We are in a close discussion with the U.S. to find ways and means of, uh, you know, using uh, different ways and means of being able to achieve the same objectives as far as the U.S. is concerned. So it is important that we engage with uh, them to ensure that the, you, uh, that the use of drone strikes in Pakistan territory t should cease immediately. As I said, this is something that the Parliament of Pakistan has put through as a resolution. This is a position that Pakistan has held for uh, consistently. So we would hope that we would find uh, more uh, acceptability of this. Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part three for today, part three. My website is ggnonline.com and on YouTube is ddarko2012 and ddarko2013. Um, also, the headlines and links will be posted in YouTube's video description. And if you would like to donate, um, five bucks, whatever, dude. I, I mean, anything helps. It would definitely be appreciated. You can do that at ggnonline.com through PayPal. So, all right, well, I've been covering a lot of news in these three videos, and we're going to take it further uh, into Asia and that. But first, we're going to uh, leave off, or start off where we left off, which was Israel. Turkey accuses Israel of exploiting Syrian civil war to advance settlements. Says they're, uh, they're urging Israel to stop destroying the basis for peace. And when you go down here, it says that Turkey has accused the Israeli government of exploiting the ongoing Syrian civil war to advance its settlement enterprise a move likely to deepen the diplomatic rift between the two nations. Their foreign minister on Monday released a statement strongly condemning Israel for its plans to build 130 new housing units in East Jerusalem's uh, Har Hama neighborhood, which is located beyond the Green Line. In a period when the intention of international community has focused on the developments in Syria, by exploiting the situation, Israel's persistence or persistence, sorry, maintenance of settlement activities in contradiction of international law it says, and despite the calls by the international community, is a grave mistake that continues to be the biggest obstacle in uh, basically establishing the peace process. And this is where we kind of left off. High court orders Migron outposts evacuated within three days. So a court rejects the resident's petition to delay eviction. Uh, it says demolitions of homes. Decision delays demolition of homes in Block 10 until purchase claims are examined. Residents refuse to say whether they'll resist evacuation. So the High Court mandates that all 50 families in the West Bank outpost of Migron must evacuate their homes no later than Tuesday. And Gaza to be unlivable by 2020 unless immediate action is taken. Of course, this is by the United Nations, right? So they're in there uh, talking about human rights against Iran. What the hell, right? It says here, Gaza will no longer be livable by 2020 unless urgent measures are taken to improve the area's water supply, power, health, and schooling, according to UN report. Until the blockade is lifted against Gaza, stands little no chance of improving its situation, especially since it doesn't have an airport or seaport. As of right now, Gaza is 80% aid dependent, relying on foreign funding in a tunnel economy, which brings in food construction materials like electronics and cars from Egypt. The experts say tightening Iran's sanctions hurts ordinary Iranians. I've mentioned this before about what the real purpose is. Iran is hosting a summit for dozens of nations in a non-alignment movement, while some of those countries are complying with the U.S. and international sanctions against Tehran for its nuclear pro program. They say it's for peaceful purposes, but either way... Director of the National Iranian American Council says U.S. policy towards Iran is doing more harm than good. We've gone from a policy that is supposed to be smart sanctions or targeted sanctions instead to one that are designed to cripple the entire Iranian economy. He says it's a counterproductive approach and that this hurts ordinary people. It obstructs rather than facilitates diplomacy. And at the end of the day, I think it's going to put us on a collision course for a military confrontation with Iran. A lot of people see the reason behind the sanctions, which is a nuclear crisis, but they don't see that. They don't see that it's connected to their daily lives. 
but they see the sanctions connected to their daily lives. They've been complaining about higher food prices. One viewer shows the price of milk increased by 14% in only four days. Another viewer submitted a satirical picture of a chicken tea bag, mocking how chicken is so expensive the same bird has to be used uh, twice to prepare several meals. It's an unfortunate byproduct of sanctions, and oftentimes it's the people who don't support the region, or the, I'm sorry, the regime in these countries that are hurt the most by sanctions, which is very sad and unfortunate. Then it's something that I saw in the news as well, as far as sanctions go. Blizzard bans Iranians from World of Warcraft, citing sanctions. So they've confirmed that they're banning all Iranians from accessing the game because of U.S. sanctions. We're talking about this non-alliance -align uh, movement. More world leaders arrive in Tehran for the NAM summit. So they have an interesting uh, set of leaders that were there, including Iraq's prime ministers, uh, Sudan's, Jordan's, and it goes on here and it says that the United Nations Secretary Ban Ki-moon has also participated in the Tehran summit despite strong opposition from U.S. and Israel. Well, that's bullshit because they probably were there. He was probably there at the direction of them uh, to basically um, turn attention away from what's going on in Israel and Syria and towards Tehran. And the Israeli Prime Minister has his own thoughts on it. He says that the NAM summit in Tehran is a disgrace to humanity says large presence at conference proves never again is a hollow pledge. So they condemn, they strongly condemn the non-aligned movement summit taking place in Tehran, calling it a disgrace. Today over 120 countries are meeting in Tehran while the regime there denies the Holocaust and works to destroy the Zionist state. This is a disgrace to humanity. The Lady of Peace statue unveiled in Tehran's Milad Tower. Statue symbolizing peace has been set up in Tehran's Milad Tower to introduce the Iranian capital as a place for promoting peace while hosting the 16th Non-Alignment Movement Summit. It features a woman holding an olive twig in her right hand. Speaking of olive branches and reaching out, Japan, North Korea hold first direct talks in four years. So the officials from both countries are holding their first talks in four years to resolve some outstanding issues and establish formal diplomatic ties. This is interesting. The latest talks were planned after Japanese and North Korea Red Cross officials agreed earlier in August to return the remains of Japanese nationals who died in North Korea during World War II. Interesting, too, because some of the comments have said that, uh, thank God, at least the Japanese have come to their senses and taken step without the great Satan to solve regional issues I can see the Pentagon starting to sweat over this. They don't like when other nations solve their disagreements peacefully. In Pakistan, Pakistan's uh, another wild card that I've mentioned before. They could go towards Russia. And um, right now you have what? Uh, these drone strikes. U.S. must immediately end deadly drone strikes in Pakistan, uh, says Pakistan's foreign minister in Iran. She says it's unlawful and counterproductive. Tension between the two sides intensified after the U.S. launched airstrikes on two Pakistani military checkpoints near the Afghan border in November 2011, killing 24 Pakistani soldiers. Just crazy because they're going after the same terrorists um, that were probably backed or created by the West. So they don't want the drone strikes, but at the same time, they don't want the terrorists that are being imported into their country. Unexploded Nazi bombs or Nazi bomb forces evacuation in central Warsaw. A huge unexploded Nazi bomb was found beneath the streets of central Warsaw on Tuesday, forcing evacuation of 3,000 people. And this is interesting because I saw another one, which was this. World War II bomb discovered in Munich city center. So one in Poland and one in Germany. Uh, it says here some 2,500 people had to leave their homes for safety reasons. So I see this as kind of a symbolic thing, right? This is this is something from the past, you know, the, the old cliche is saying about, you know, old, uh, you know, fr scars from wars uh, never actually, never really heal. So I think this is kind of coming back into the forefront to show people about the effects of World War II, like landmines that are still going off in World War II, right? Russia calls on United States to ratify nuclear test ban treaty. It has been adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1996 but it's yet to come into force. So the representative from Russia said Russia's proposal on the treaty to ban the deployment of weapons in space is being blocked by certain Western states. They're convinced that the treaty's ratification by the United States would significantly speed up the process of the document coming into force. So far, it has been signed by 183 and ratified by 157, but major nuclear powers either refuse to sign or fail to ratify. 
the U.S. Senate rejected the treaty in 99. I agree with someone in the comment board. He said, uh, you know, as far as disarming Israel and uh, United States, you know, good luck with that. Bombshell, U.S. neocons, State Department behind terror wave in Russia. Barbarians are at the gate. Talking about terrorism, the United States, and the subversion of Russia, which I've been talking about recently. The shootings and bombings in this uh, Ingushetia and Dagestan this week rekindled a long-standing brutal campaign of violence and terrorism in Russia's Caucasus region, one that has seen more of its share of terror stretching back to the Chechen rebellion, quote, rebellion of the 1990s, which we were talking about before, which was what? Russia fears that the victory of the Saudi Qatari-sponsored jihadist groups in Syria could also have a negative impact on the situation in Russia's North Caucasus, where the Wahhabi insurgency is widespread, especially in regions of Chechnya and Dagestan. Actually, the insurgency in the north of the Caucasus has been funded by the Saudi private organizations and individuals. The attacks are not simply isolated terrorist actions, but rather, says here, orchestrated events carried out by well-connected criminal networks whose goal is to foment conflict and carry out the agenda of U.S. intelligence establishment and its subversion of Russia. When talking about propaganda, the complex network of terrorist organizations that operate under the banners of separatism and independence for the Caucasus region has been under or at the center of destabilization of Russia for the past two decades. Within hours of the deadly attacks, the uh, Kavka Center, an organization known to be propaganda mouthpiece of the terrorist leader Daku Omarov, released an article characterizing the attacks as heroic attacks or acts of attacks <laughs> and referring to the dead as Russian puppets. And, al and although their mission, this uh, mouthpiece, propaganda mouthpiece mission, is to provide reporting events and journalistic integrity in the Caucasus, this is, in fact, very much par for the course of or foreign organization that is funded by the U.S. State Department and Finland's foreign ministry. Russia's bin Laden, this Dhaka Umarov, led terrorist death squads in Chechnya during the 90s up until 2011 when the U.N. finally listed him as an Al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorist. So this Kafka Center was funded by the U.S. State Department, his propaganda clearinghouse, as well as several supporting fronts, including the National Endowment for Democracy-funded Russian Chechen Friendship Society. And the former organization currently supports U.S. efforts to overthrow the Syrian government. The latter organization is currently back in the U.S. State Department's uh, recent PR ploy, um, the feminist ban in Russia, that was arrested for their display in the church. Going back to what we said, if the rebels topple Assad's government, Syria could then become a haven for anti-Russian activities and a source of funding and support for terrorism in the Russian territory. So this is what I was talking about, these uh, terrorist attacks. August 23rd, one soldier killed, three policemen wounded in Dagestan. And of course, they were unknown assailants who opened fire on the military checkpoint. Then August 28th, 2012, bomb kills Russian Muslim cleric and others in Dagestan. I think this is like the second time... I've uh, read about this, about a female suicide bomber, and it was came from this area, if my memory serves correct. This is a, a sheik, a 74-year-old Suvi Muslim, killed by suspected female suicide bomber in his home. So this sounds just like the tactics that were used in the beginning of the video, right? Uh, the last video, which was uh, the Syrian rebels, Western-backed um, terrorists, basically going in there and blowing up a bomb at a funeral, right? They couldn't even get a chance to bury their dead. So this uh, Sheikah was reported to have been giving a sermon in his home when a woman posing as a pilgrim approached and blew herself up. So this is this is a, a beautiful way to tie this together, unfortunately. When we're talking about using Muslims against Muslims to kill Muslims, militants have increasingly been targeting moderate Muslim leaders who have criticized extreme for forms of Islam. Brief background, the ma mainly Muslim multi-ethnic republic which is right here, has seen some of the worst militant violence in the North Caucasus in recent years. Then Georgian police reportedly eliminate terrorists on Russian border. I find this hard to believe, but it says Georgian police cornered off a mountain gorge to launch a large-scale operation against groups of kidnappers who reportedly infiltrated the country from the neighboring Russian region of Dagestan. The area was previously known as a hotbed of terrorism when Georgian authorities granted a refuge and support to all anti-Russian forces. And maybe it is true. The battle erupted after Georgian authorities spent three days searching for five young locals who went missing near the Georgian-Russian border. They discovered an armed gang and eventually a fight, but luckily all hostages were freed. The men added that all of their kidnappers wore beards and an identifying trait of radical Islamists. This is from 2010. Special camps have been established in Georgia where militants are being trained 
to be later sent to Russia. And Russian military plans to draft 50,000 